Well, I asked Martine to read the whole pericope, but let me reread the one verse that we're going to focus on today. And as you noticed, getting to chapter 11, which is the practical part of the book, we've slowed way down because there are real jewels here. Um, that harken back to the Old Testament. Narratives that we don't need to quickly gloss over because it is imperative that we understand um, how these men and women exemplified a working faith. And if we don't know those Old Testament narratives, well then we will quickly gloss over them, we'll take it lightly, and we won't be prepared to apply the doctrinal that we have learned for these previous 10 chapters. So look with me, if you will, at verse 8. We covered verse 7 last week. We're covering verse 8 this week. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. Go ahead and circle that, obeyed. By going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. You might summarize it this way. Abraham... When he was called, obeyed God, not knowing where he was going. Abraham, when he was divinely called by God to do something that was very difficult, obeyed, not seeing where he was going, not knowing the destination. That is the kind of faith the preacher wants this small uh, Hebrew church to embrace, to understand. This Hebrew church that wants so badly to go back to the Old Covenant because they think it will alleviate the pressure of persecution, he's reminding them from the Old Covenant, that's the kind of faith you need to have. And the New Covenant embodies that kind of genuine faith. And you guys aren't acting like it, is what he's saying. By faith. When Abraham was called, obeyed, not even knowing where he was going. This small church has been called to draw near, to hold fast to the anchor of their soul, to work their faith that they claim to have, to persevere. And today he's going to give them an example. We've seen Abel... We've seen Enoch, we've seen Noah, now we see Abram. Now, there are some differences. We're going to learn about the call of Abraham today, and we're going to learn about his obedience to that call. And while we're not in the business of claiming land to advance God's kingdom, we are in the business of claiming souls. Amen? And so the parallels are, are strong. But I think in order to understand how we are to obey the call like Abraham, we have to realize something. I'm going to put it out there, and now I'm going to explain it through the sermon. We must realize that we have all been called. Let me say that again. We have all been called. And we are all called to order our lives to be obedient to that call. Both of those things are factual. Both of those things are non-negotiable. Both of those things exemplify genuine faith. There are no alternatives besides that. The faith that God gives works. We're not saved by our works, but genuine faith will persevere. Genuine faith will not only realize the call, not only obey the call, but will order our lives in such a way that we thrive and obey the call. One author describes the parallel this way. The call of God to Abraham is a sneak preview for the rest of the Bible. It is a story of God bringing salvation to all tribes and all nations through His holy nation, administered at first by the Mosaic Covenant, and then by our Lord Jesus Christ through the new covenant. So we're going to look at Abraham together. Turn with me, if you will, back to Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to spend the next 
several weeks looking at the faith of Abraham. Specifically today, we're going to look at the call. Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to cover verses 1 through 9. If you're taking notes, and I would really encourage you to do so, at least in your Bible, we're going to look at the call to obedience, and then we're going to look at obedience to the call. Point one, call to, call to obedience. Point two, obedience to the call. Let me pray for us one more time. We'll ask the Lord to bless the ministry of His Word. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we come to You as a body of believers, anxious to hear from Your inerrant, inspired, authoritative, all-sufficient Word of God. We're so excited as we study the book of Hebrews and we hear this preacher exhort this small church, a church much like ours, to not only endure persecution, but to thrive as we hold fast to the anchor of our soul. And for ten chapters, he has given us great doctrines of the faith, great Christology and understanding who Jesus is, what he has done, his person and work on the cross, and his person and work in our lives, in the lives of the church today. He is our great high priest. And now the preacher calls on us to work out our faith with fear and trembling. To follow the examples who have walked the ancient paths before us. To walk like Enoch. To give the best of who we are and what we have like Abel. To obey like Noah. And today, to obey the call like Abraham. Father, I pray that this narrative is crystal clear to us. That we would not look at Abraham as some figure from the distant past. Someone from the ancient Near East that we cannot relate to. But rather someone who obeyed the call. And it cost him dearly. But the cost was only temporal. For he was in the Lord's hands. And God's Word is sure. Encourage us today, Lord. Fan the flame of our hearts. Help us to realize this call upon our lives. The great privilege it is to be called by God. And the great responsibility. Excite us, Lord. Energize us as a church that we might with great fervor obey the call. Together, living our lives in such a manner that brings You the greatest glory. And may we enjoy every step of the way, even when we cannot see the destination. Father, we thank You for our time around the Lord's table. And we thank You for the celebration of the ordinance of baptism this evening. May Your Son, Jesus Christ, receive all the glory. May I get out of the way of the text today. And may You... Change us by your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's look at the call to obedience. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you. God calls Abram from Ur the Chaldees, in the ancient Near East, modern-day Iraq, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, he gives him a divine call, and he asks him to do something. What does he ask him to do? What exactly is God asking Abram, who, by the way, is a pagan, to do? Well, there's three things. Leave your country, leave your relatives, and your father's house. Let me translate this for us. Leave your homeland. Leave your family. Leave all that you are. Leave it all behind. Your inheritance, your reputation, your way of life, everything you have known. And go to a place I'm not going to tell you. Forsake all that you are and follow God. Now, even when I say that, it sounds dramatic, but it, it still seems a bit distant to me. Abraham is this 
this Bedouin um, man from the past, lived somewhere around 2166 B.C. Uh, he dwelt in tents. He had livestock. He was married to Sarah. He ends up having a son, Isaac. And that's about the extent of it in my mind. So when you talk about the call to Abraham, it just doesn't resonate with me. I don't know how you feel about it, but, but I have to force myself to realize the cost to obey this call. We don't think much about moving in our increasingly mobile society. We don't think much about taking a job halfway across the country or even going overseas. It's not a big deal to leave your family, to leave your relatives. Heck, for some of us, it's a benefit, right? Ah, I get to start fresh. I don't have to deal with my in-laws anymore. But in the ancient Near East, you're asking the impossible. You're asking people to leave their entire identity. For your entire identity was wrapped up in your family, your hometown, your inheritance, the family business, the land that your family had owned for generations. These security blankets aren't easy to just drop and walk away from. Who's going to take care of you when something goes wrong? Abraham's already an old man. What happens when he has no income? There is no unemployment insurance. Ur of the Chaldees was a sprawling metropolis. It had benefits to living there, as pagan as it was. Who's going to take care of Abram and Sarai when they get old? There are no nursing homes in the land of Canaan. They are illegal immigrants. If they get hurt, they can't even go to the Canaanite general hospital and get health care. First of all, there is no Canaanite general hospital, and Abraham wouldn't be welcome there anyway. Let me make a point here. These are Canaanites. They don't care about foreigners' well-beings. People who sacrifice their own children don't care about you needing heart medication. They don't care how you live. They don't care whether you live or die. It is a hostile environment. Abram left a lot. He lived in a house. We don't think about that, but you imagine being 75 years old and no longer living in a house? You're going to live in tents the rest of your life? I don't like that much. I don't even like the camp. And this guy's going to spend the rest of his life doing it. He went to a place where there's no more market nearby. He left his business. Don't think for a minute that this guy didn't have a thriving business. I imagine it was Abram's woolen mills and grass-fed beef. Maybe if he was a really sporting guy, he raised racing camels or something. They had businesses. They had wealth. They had employees. They had slaves. They had barns. And yet he sold out. For what? To go to a land I will show you. I want you to feel the uncertainty. I want you to feel the uncertainty of going to a destination that you don't know where it is, you don't know what it holds for you, and you don't know how you will get there. And you have an entourage of a family that you have to provide for, and you don't know how you will do that on a daily basis. And you don't even know whether someone will buy whatever you're selling to get the grain you need to feed your family. And what happens if you go a long stretch and there is no water? I'm in my 50s and I wouldn't take that kind of risk. This guy's in his 70s. To a land I will show you. John Calvin paraphrases it this way, I command thee to go forth with closed eyes. You see, when the preacher brings up Abraham as the example of faith, Abraham gets more print on faith than just about anyone in the Old Testament. It's piercing these Hebrews' hearts. You see, they know Father Abraham. They know what he went through. 
They know what he left behind. They know what this preacher is saying when this Hebrew church is whining and complaining that persecution is coming and it's tough and I don't like not being liked. And when he brings up Abraham, they're like, oh, really? You're pulling the Abraham card? Really? Okay, I'll listen. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, what? Not seen. What can this Hebrew church not see? A lot. They don't know how it's going to end. Nero is emperor. Their family has rejected them. They have lost their business. A lot of them have quit meeting on Sundays. They have forsaken the assembling together. We don't know how this is going to end. And he said, yeah, neither did Abraham. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Side note here, don't forget who the original readers of Genesis were. These are Israelites in the wilderness, probably 1445 B.C., What are they being called to do? They're they're being called to go forth from their country. We don't think about it that way, but Egypt was all these people ever knew. Don't think of them as slaves in some sort of prisoner of war camp. The Jews, the Israelites, had been in Egypt 400 years. As I look around, most of our families haven't been in America for 200 years even. This was the only land they knew. And while they had maintained a measure of separation, Egypt was it. The food, the landscape, the security. I can go to the well, there is water there. Though I may not like the food, I get food and sustenance on a daily basis. I have a house. And yet what does God promise as these Israelites are looking through Abraham's eyes. Look at Genesis 12, 2 again. Notice the number of eyes here. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, Abraham, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. This is not a blind faith, though Abram doesn't know where he is going. This is not a blind faith for the Israelites, though they have never been to the promised land. This is not a blind faith for the Hebrew church, though they don't know how it will end. Can I also say this is not a blind faith for us as we go into the horizon of persecution? Why? Because God is not asking them to have a blind faith. He's asking them to have a faith that trusts in God. I will, I will, I will. He says there is no secure trust. You don't have to be able to see it to know that God sees it. God has chosen it. God is in control. And that's what's missing with most of our understanding of faith. That's what's missing with my understanding of faith. And you read the book of Hebrews, you get the Christology, you get the doctrine, and it's not till you get to the hall of faith that you realize God is saying, I'm not asking you to trust in something that is mystical, something that can't be seen. I'm asking you to trust in me. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's an absolute certainty. Look what he promises Abraham. Land, seed, and blessing. He's going to give him land. He's called to leave everything behind and go to a place that God will give him. Did it happen? Well, yes and no. Yes, but not during his lifetime. I don't like that kind of faith very much. I like the kind of faith that, okay, I may have to wait a while, but I get to see it, right? Do you realize that when Abraham died, do you know what land he owned? A cemetery plot his dead wife's cemetery plot, the cave of Machpelah. If you go to Hebron today, 
in the Palestinian territory, you can see the area that he owned. That was it. You don't live in a cemetery plot. He owned nothing. He did not see the land that God gave him. And yet, did God give him the land? Yes. Eventually. What about seed? You're an old man. Your wife is postmenopausal, but I'm going to give you seed. Great. And he gave him Isaac. Not exactly a nation, okay? Yet. But he did give him a nation. And in fact, he gave him more than that because he gave him and would give him the ultimate seed. Listen to Paul in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Now, now, now think about the connection. This Hebrew church is hearing a story that they know very well about a man who is called to leave everything and go forth to a place that he does not know and cannot see, and he will give him land that he will not receive, and he promises him seed that he will not see, and now they understand that that seed is ultimately Jesus Christ. That they're thinking of leaving. This preacher's not even really asking them to have faith, is he? Because they get to look back and see. It was Abraham that had to have faith. He could not see. But they're able to look back and see God did give him the land. And God did give him seed. In fact, the seed is Jesus Christ. And what they're supposed to feel right now, what we're supposed to feel right now, is our faith strengthened. Our joints made stronger. Our confidence in the object of our faith more sure. Because our faith is based upon the object of our faith. The person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, he promises him blessing. No doubt God is blessed. As I look around the room this morning, we are the nations of the earth who have been blessed. We are the nations. We are the Gentiles. We are the ones who are far off, who have been drawn near. We were those who are outside the camp, whom God graciously brought us into. And Christ died for us as well. Galatians 3, 8, the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So think about our situation. We're not even going through persecution yet. But just the mere fact that, that we are recipients of the atoning work of Jesus Christ which was a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. The fact that we as Gentiles, as I look out, I see, I see Africans, I see Indians, I see Brits and, and, and French, and I see all different types. All of us. I don't think there's a Jew in the place. That is something that should get us fired up about faith. God has done above and beyond all that we could ask or think. But we're supposed to make the point that Abraham didn't see it during his lifetime. And so therefore we have to hold fast to the anchor of our soul. I want to dive deeper on this call, if I might, here for a moment. It has two imperatives followed by three promises each. I just want to focus on the two imperatives this morning. Abram is to go and be a blessing. That's his responsibility. He is to go to where he does not know, and he is to be a blessing. We're going to talk about what it means to be a blessing in a moment. And so, if I don't know anything, and I know God's Word is timeless, I'm to emulate the faith of Abraham that obeys when he is called. Obeys when he is called, even when he doesn't know where he's going. Abraham was chosen by God, 
and called to advance his kingdom and to be a blessing to the world. This was also to inspire the Israelites who were to go and advance God's kingdom by reclaiming the land. Abraham was to go to a land that was not yet his and to claim it, even though he never saw it. The Israelites were to go and to claim the promised land. We, under the new covenant, again, we're not claiming land, but we are claiming souls. So we, too, have a call. We have a call to ministry. Is, is that a true statement? Because we don't use, use it in that way, do we? Called to ministry, especially here in the South. I have people ask me all the time, well, have you been called to ministry? Have you been called? You have to say it with a Southern accent. Well, I was called to ministry when I was 16 years old. Okay, I'm going to rattle some cages here this morning. I don't believe in a call to ministry like we use here in the South, in Southern Baptist arenas. I don't believe that pastors are the only ones who are supposed to have a warm and fuzzy feeling about where they're supposed to go and what church they're supposed to preach at, and there's this mystical thing and they just got to find it. Why would something be true for pastors and not true for other Christians? Now, to be fair, do I believe that God puts an unction within us to use our gifts within the body? Amen. We learned about that this morning. Do I believe that God divinely orders our steps and causes men and women to affirm our gifts? Absolutely. Do I believe that when we are obedient, He places us sovereignly where we should be? Absolutely. But I do not believe in a warm and fuzzy feeling where we are called to ministry, quote-unquote, in a specific area to a specific congregation. That could be just last night's chili. Okay? And I'm kind of being hard on my own camp here, but the problem is, is that what happens when that pastor doesn't stay? Who was he listening to on that call? No, no, no. The fact is, there is no, watch this, there is no clergy lady distinction in the New Testament. There is no priest and people. There is our Lord Jesus Christ who is the high priest. Okay? All of us have been divinely called. There is one call in the New Testament. Do you know what it is? A call to salvation. And a call to salvation, watch this, is a call to ministry. Well, now you're getting in my kitchen, right? A call to ministry. One theologian says it this way, the New Testament gives no indication that a pastor must be called by God in the same way that the prophets and high priests were called in the Old Testament. Moreover, the New Testament never applies the termination of calling to the pastoral office, but only to the Christian life in general. So if you are a believer here today, if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have been called by God to ministry. You may get your paycheck in engineering, in school teaching, in janitorial work, as a doctor, but you are called to ministry. It may not be the 40 hours a week of what you do, but it is to be the most important work you do. We are all called to ministry. It applies to every Christian. 2 Timothy 1.9, God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Wow, I thought we were just starting out about how Abraham uh, was faithful even when he couldn't see the road ahead. And then like, Pastor, you just did a bait and switch on us. You just basically told us that all of us have been called in the same way as Abraham to leave it all behind. To forsake everything else in comparison to being in the service of the king. That's exactly what Scripture is saying. Our ministry call, if you are a believer, is to advance God's kingdom by helping others know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. 
We are not claiming land, but we are advancing God's kingdom by claiming souls, helping others to know Jesus Christ and grow to be like him. And yet, and this is where we get to the reality of it all, most of us are not living like we've been called. Let's be honest. We're just not. Even if I believe that there's not some sort of special mystical calling for pastors, but that we're all called, are we really living like we've been called? The answer is no. And the excuse is usually, well, I'm just in a busy season of life. True. I've got a lot going on. I'm trying to build my business. I'm trying to raise kids. No one's ever trained me. I don't know where I would find the time. I understand that feeling. I have been there. I've identified with that. I want to challenge it, though. I'm not sure we are so thinly stretched as we think we are. Listen to these stats. The average American spends 1.7 hours daily doing household activities. Two hours per week playing sports or exercising. 20 minutes per day reading. Seven hours and 50 minutes on smartphones, desktops, and other devices. Nine minutes a day doing spiritual activities. Okay, so to be fair, I know a lot of the screen time is work time. But what I can't get past is the nine minutes a day on spiritual activities. 2 Timothy 2, 4, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. One of the practical things I want to help us do as a congregation is to kill the tyranny of the urgent. Once we all start to realize that we've all been called to ministry and that it is a difficult calling, but it is a joyful calling, then the next thing we need to do is get practical and say, we gotta, we got to clear our schedules. we got to start dealing with the important instead of the urgent. And it's going to take some time, and it's going to take some adjustment, and we can't do it alone. But don't think for a minute that this was easy on Abraham. Don't think for a minute that your life was somehow more important, busier, or more complicated than Abraham's. Have you ever tried to live without running water, electricity, feed a large group of people, and do it when you're 75? No. We have been called out of paganism, chosen by God, put into service as His ambassadors, and given promises for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom whatever the hurdles are in our way, we need to just pause and realize that's, that's a tremendous privilege. So the question is, are we going to obey the call? Since we've all been called to ministry, are we going to obey the call? I think we need to start with just the, just the concept of obedience. Kind of get that out of the way. Especially here in Texas, where we're all independent, we are very uncomfortable with the concept of obedience. We like obedience when we agree with it, right? That's not called obedience. That's called agreement. <laughs> we uh, don't like to be told what to do. I don't like to be told what to do. It feels very uncomfortable. We cry legalism, right? And yet Scripture is very clear that genuine faith delights in obeying our Lord. Obedience is a large part of faith. Listen to Paul in, in his treatise on the doctrine of salvation from Romans chapter 6. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Paul directly equates salvation with the phrase obedient from the heart. 
Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham didn't believe and stay in Ur. Abraham believed and moved forward. He was obedient from the heart. That's the kind of faith this preacher wants us to have. That's the kind of faith he wants this Hebrew church to have. A faith like Abraham's that is willing to move forward. We, if we're believers, have all become obedient from the heart. That means that the faith we had had a genuine willingness to leave it all behind, to turn from our sin and self-worship and turn and bow the knee to Christ. A, a genuine willingness. That's the kind of faith we have. Where is it falling apart? We're not moving forward. You see, there's two ways in which Abraham obeys. He is called to go and he's called to be a blessing. In, in real practical terms... He walks, go, he walks, and being a blessing, he worships. Can I show you? Because I think it'll really encourage you. He walks and he worships. Being obedient from the heart is starts, starts by putting one foot in front of another. He literally cast aside the excuses. I can imagine if I was Abraham, I would have had a ton i got back problems, rheumatoid arthritis. You don't understand. I've got uh, bills to pay. I've got people depending upon me. I've got this entire business. But he doesn't. He walks. He sells out and he leaves Ur. Is it any different for us? I would say being obedient from the heart, being obedient to the call, starts with leaving it all behind. Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. That doesn't mean you need to reject your family, leave your family. What it does mean is there needs to be such a willingness there that you actually start to walk in a direction, start to order your life in a direction that shows that ministry is top priority. Above family. Above friends. Above business. Above special interests. Where people look at your life and they say, that guy, though he may not get his, his check from the church, he is in full-time ministry. That's the difference. Our call to salvation, becoming obedient from the heart, is as much letting go as it is getting. We don't think of it that way, do we? We think of it as we gain heaven, and we do. But the call to salvation is saying, I'm giving it up. I, I, I'm, I'm giving it up. Genesis 12, 5, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And thus they came to the land of Canaan. And by the way, side note here, he shepherded his family to do the same. I'm sure Sarai was nervous. I'm sure she was scared. I'm sure Lot, I'm confident Lot didn't want to go. <laughs> But then he also is a blessing in that he worships along the way. Now, this is something very interesting. You may know the, uh, the call of Abraham. What you may not realize is what that call looked like as he was walking and as he was worshiping. Look at these next few verses with me. Verse 6, Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now, the Canaanite was in the land. Don't forget about that phrase right there. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give the land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now there's something very interesting going on here. It says he came to the Oak of Moreh. Like, well, that's interesting. I guess they, they named trees back then, right? No, there's something more going on here. In this little sentence following it, now the Canaanite was in the land helps us indicate that the Oak of Moreh was actually a Canaanite shrine. 
More literally means oracle giver. And these pagans would sit around underneath the branches and listen to the wind go through the trees, kind of hold hands in a cuckoo cuckoo okay? And they would worship their pagan god. You say, well, that's kind of interesting, just a little side color here. No. Look what Abraham does. He builds an altar at the the Canaanite pagan shrine. This is you going down to the Colleyville Mosque, setting up a Metro Bible booth, and handing out gospel tracts. The only difference is, is that Abraham built a permanent structure there. This is bold worship. This is a guy who is in full-time ministry. He gets better. Look at verse 8. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord to the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. He does the same thing at Bethel. Beth, house, El, God. But this is not talking about God, Yahweh God. This is talking about El, who is the chief Canaanite deity, the God above all gods. He goes to another pagan shrine. And what does he do? He rolls up with his construction crew, pulls out the the saws and the cement mixers, and says, let's build a worship center here. Are you serious? Let me explain to you what he is doing. He is claiming land for God. He's saying, God is in town, and I worship him and him alone. He calls upon the name of the Lord. He does the same thing in chapter 13, builds another altar to the oaks at the oaks of Mamre. Why is he building these altars in the shadows of pagan sanctuaries? The tree-hugging oaks of Mamre, the first Canaanite shrine of Scientology. Why is he doing all this? Well, I used to have a dear friend. He's he's passed on since. He was a radio operator when the Allies took Iwo Jima. And when I say Iwo Jima, what picture comes to mind? Remember? Raising of the flag. And what did that symbolize? This ain't yours anymore, Japanese. This is America's. And they planted their flag. Abraham is planting God's flag with no concern for his reputation. God called me. I believe it so much that though I may never see it, I'm planting his flag. Calvin again says, Abram endeavored as much as to him to lay and dedicate to God every part of the land to which he had access, and he perfumed it with the odor of his faith. Isn't that a great description? His life was such that everyone knew who he worshipped, and he moved forward in walking, going to a destination that he could not see, but he trusted in the person who called him. What were the Israelites called to do? Go out and walk and worship. Go and worship God in the wilderness and then walk the land. And on every place where the sole of your foot treads, God says, I'll give it to you. The promised land. And yet they were just pictures. What is he calling his church to do today? to go forth and, great commission, make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Do you know what baptism is? This person is no longer a pagan. I'm planting this flag. He's God's. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's wearing a new jersey. He is a child of the King. And then we train him and disciple him. And we do it even though we may never see how it all ends. So, what do we do practically? 
I think it starts with priority. I think it is indisputable that we are all called to ministry. I think it is undeniable that we are called to obey that call in a radical way the way Abraham did. But what does that actually mean? Rod, give me some, give me some practicals. Well, I wrote a couple things down here. I went back to Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. I think that we, in community, no longer make decisions based upon our wants and our desires and our plans, but that everything we do, we seek to do for the kingdom. The way I spend my time, the way I spend my money, the way I, the way I order my home, the way I order my schedule. How can I help advance God's kingdom in ministry? Because I'm there. Derek Kidner points out that the only structures Abram left were altars. There were no relics of his wealth. The footprint he made on this earth was not reflected in building monuments to his career or to himself, but altars to the Lord. I think we endeavor to do the same. That doesn't mean that we don't build our family and raise our kids and do these things, but that does mean that we sit down as a family, dads especially, and we say, hey, we have a limited amount of time, talent, and treasure. Let's spend it in ministry. Let's make it count. Let's open our lives up. Let's be willing to do that which is uncomfortable. Why? Because we have been called to help people come to know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. And God has given us a set of of talents. He's given us treasure. He's given us gifts. He's given us people, the church. And He's saying, do what you've been called to do. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just going to do whatever I want. No, we need to do what we've been called to do. And so I think we need to realize the call. Become obedient to the call. Become creative. And not a one of us will regret it. I'll promise you, when Abram died, he did not regret a life spent in obedience to the call. Amen? 